Okay, uh, good morning to everybody. Uh, I'm glad to talk to you all uh, this morning. Um, uh, before I get into what I need to discuss with you today, I would wish to give you a little introduction to who I am and what I do. Uh, I'm Eric Fokam. Uh, I am uh, with a senior lecturer, but that will be an assistant professor of uh, actually entomology <laughs> at the University Department of Zoology at the University of Boyam. And uh, more recently, I've researched uh, in biodiversity and conservation biology. And recently, we, we, are, we are actually pioneering uh, the Laboratory for Biodiversity and Conservation Biology at the University of Boyam. So this morning, I'm going to be talking to you about zoological and botanical codes of nomenclature. And in so doing, you're going to hear essentially stuff that is uh, very, very theoretical, but this theory is at the basis of you making publications that would be valid and accepted. Okay? So if you don't do this appropriately, you're probably running the risk of doing what or getting what town says. You're going to have your material uh, kicked out and you will be frustrated and be complaining that you have been duped or robbed when you haven't actually been. So we're going to uh, start our discussion. Uh, by saying that uh, every zoologist or botanist, and I'm restricting this discussion uh, to that framework, that every zoologist or botanist knows that the true and official or scientific name of an animal or a plant consists of two words. The first one, which is the genus name, and the second, which is the specific name. Note I said the specific name, I didn't say the species name. These two words uh, from the form what we call the binomen, and thus will represent the long established, I say long, now long established system of binomial nomenclature. The need to uh, identify and name animals and plants has been recognized quite early in, I would say, the history of modern man. And right from the time of Aristotle, here you can see Aristotle, whose name is quite famous. Sometimes I hate him a little because I think that his overwhelming influence on human thought actually forced human ideas to stagnate for an extremely long time because no one dared to challenge Aristotle's ideas. Most of the things he said were final and for several, I would say almost millennia, nobody dare challenge the truth that he has given. Yet he's a great scientist, and right from his time and the time of uh, the Greeks that were his contemporary, the need was recognized to have a way of naming organisms, and they used some system, but unfortunately this system was not flexible enough and would not be able to account for the present day's uh, known complexity of nature. The first step in developing modern nomenclature were those leading to the binomial nomenclature. Basically, prior to 1753, scientific names were binary. And what we say binary, the clear distinction was made between the genus name and the, specific, and the specific name, or the species name. And as such, the genus name could be made up of several words. At the same time, the species name could also be a very long phrase, or at least a combination of several words, okay? So, the present system, we owe it to a uh, Swedish uh, physician, who was also a botanist and a zoologist, and well, he was a scientist, a knowledgeable person named Carolus Von Nelius. And this, I don't think so far I've taught you anything new. I'm sure everybody in this hall knows who Carl Linnaeus uh, was. So Linnaeus adopted the binomial system of names, I would say that is used today, in two steps. In 1753, in the, sec in the two volumes of the first editions of the book uh, Species Plantarum, he adopted the system for, he proposed and adopted the system for naming uh, plants. And later on, five years after, in the 10th edition of Systema Naturae, he also proposed 
and opted the system for naming animals. The scientific names are basically Latinized because at the time of Linnaeus, Latin was the language of educated people of the time. So basically, if Linnaeus was working today, what language would we adopt? Don't tell me Chinese. No, it would definitely be English because that is the language in which everybody at the time uh, did communicate, okay? However, Linnaeus was not the first person to actually use binomial nomenclature. Some two brothers, uh, is it Caspar and Johan Bahin or something? I, I kind of forgot the other part. 200 years before him, they had actually proposed and used binomial nomenclature, but they were not consistent in their use of that system. And actually, Linnaeus acknowledges them very much by naming one genus of plant after them. He clearly acknowledged their contribution to this effort by naming a full genus of plant after them. So we're going to move basically into defining a few terms. And these terms are terms that we encounter a lot in the literature and in discussion either in systematic taxonomy or whatever else. And these terms, sometimes we use some of them interchangeably, but they need to be clarified at least for the purpose of uh, proper understanding. And the first one, I am afraid not to uh, define it as well as the masters have done before, but we're going to say that systematics would be basically uh, a study of the, bi or the diversity of living things, both those that are alive and those that have gone extinct. Okay? And this will take into account their similarity, their differences, and the relationship between them through time. Basically, we're going to say that systematic is a multidisciplinary field that would borrow uh, 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 knowledge and technology techniques from several other fields and will not dwell onto that at this moment. We're also quickly going to mention taxonomy, which essentially will define, or is a set of laws, and defines categories and arranges them in a way that is hierarchical. We're also going to mention here now what a taxonomic category is. Okay, a taxonomic category we are going to say is an abstract framework within which organisms would be arranged. Abstract because when I say a species, or a class, or a genus, Nobody practically can tell me what is the link between uh, a species of ants and a species of birds or, but this is a framework that we understand and to which we have assigned a certain ranking, a certain level. And we're going to also use the term taxon. And with taxon, we're going to say taxon is a set of real organisms that share similar characters at a particular level, okay? So when you say plants, you are talking about a real taxon. People know what are the features of plants. Now, the trick here is that when you say plant also, I'm going to tell you that you have actually referred to a taxonomic rank. What rank would that be? If you say plants, what rank are you talking about? About a kingdom, right. So any named category is a taxon because basically you've put real organisms within a certain framework. Are we okay with that? Sure, okay. I'm also going to proceed with the term identification. Note that the purpose of some of these definitions is to simply make us clearly understand what we are dealing with, okay? So we're going to say that identification is a process of assigning individuals, organisms, into already established groups into already established groups and we're going to follow that uh, follow with what we call classification and classification is the assignment of identified specimens or organisms into the hierarchy of the living things so basically after you've identified a new frog to be uh, what new frog are we going to talk about uh, Dave is going to give us any new frog he has or he's had before and then you need to place it into all the higher rankings that we've mentioned 
previously. You need to give it, well, we've given the genus and a, speci a specific name, but you need to give it, assign it to a subfamily, family, and so on and so forth. That is classification. Now, we also mentioned here species description. And I wanted to put that because I know several people are interested in the term or in describing species. I want to say species description is a formal account of newly discovered species, usually in the form of a scientific paper. And you provide a clear description of the new species of organism and explains how it differs from previously uh, describe a related organism. And that last step is what we call the diagnosis. What are those things, that, those things that set it aside, that make it unique, and as such, we qualify it to be a new species. The description also contains illustrations of the type of material, of the type material and explain in which museums type material have been deposited. That is essential. Nobody's going to let you publish a new species without saying where the types have been deposited so that people can refer to it. Okay? And the provision will also have to give the news, the name, the former scientific name of that new species. You will not do it and let someone else or let people guess what it is. It's risk falling somewhere else. To date, uh, we presume that there are close to 2 million species that have, not presume, there are actually records that close to 2 million species have been described formally. But estimates uh, provide, uh, say that we still probably have between 9 and 12 or 15 million species. Some even exaggerate seeing it much uh, bigger, much further. But we will say something reasonable will be between 9 and say 12 or 15 million species. Linear's of uh, scheme of arranging organisms into ascending series or groups of, uh, sorry, of groups is what we call the hierarchical system, okay? And in that system, the species were grouped into genera, genera into orders, and orders into classes. That was at the time of Linnaeus, okay? But taxonomic hierarchy has been considerably extended since that time, more than three, almost 400 uh, years ago. And nowadays, the major, the major categories we, or taxa will include in descending order, domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, and so on and so forth. You can list all of them. This can be subdivided further into final categories, especially when one uses the prefixes such as super, semi, sub, infra, mini, and so on, and so forth. Now we dwell into the realm of nomenclature. Nomenclatural system, uh, system, the nomenclatural system is often simpler in theory than it would actually be in practice. We could talk here in 30 minutes on an hour, and I will tell you how easy it would be. Or I'll give you a set of rules that will look so plain and so straightforward. But I want to warn everybody going to dwell into it that it may actually be a little more tricky or a little more complicated than this presentation will show. And as such, it will be advisable to a taxonomist to be somehow introduced to the principles of nomenclatorial rules. Basically, if you want to do your description all by yourself, when you think that you have some material in your hand that is new, you don't want to rush and submit your information immediately for publication. You want to sit down and go through some of these rules or at least seek advice from someone who is used in doing that. Otherwise, uh, you are doomed to failure. That I can assure you of. Nomenclature originates from the Latin nomen, which stands for name, and calare, for calling, and thus will simply mean name calling or naming, okay? And as such, the discipline nomenclature places a label on taxa of all categories 
to permit or to allow scientists from all horizons to be able to have a platform for discussion.